This evening, the House Rules Committee considered the rules for debate for two different measures that the House will take up this week, the Federal Marriage Amendment and a bill that would repeal the Washington, D.C. gun ban. Members heard testimony on both for about an hour and a half. The uh, Rules Committee will come to order. We are uh, here today for several important measures. Uh, first and foremost is the fact that uh, last week we all uh, bemoaned the fact that uh, the Vice Chairman of the Rules Committee, Mr. Goss, had been confirmed and was moving to become Director of Central Intelligence. And we uh, had a wonderful ceremony here that uh, Mrs. Myrick will have a chance to participate in before too terribly long. We need to have you sign a gavel. You, I don't know if you've had a chance to sign it yet, but we uh, will have you sign. The, Mr. Pitts is getting it right now. We'll have you sign the gavel that we're going to be presenting to uh, Mr. Goss. And since Mr. Goss has now uh, become the director of Central Intelligence, that obviously created some opportunity for change here in the Rules Committee. So the Speaker of the House, Mr. Hastert, has made a couple of changes. First, let me announced that uh, our friend from Atlanta, Mr. Linder, is the new vice chairman of the Rules Committee. So let's give him a round of applause. Congratulations. Thank you, David. And uh, let me uh, also say that the Speaker of the House announced today that he has uh, appointed our colleague from Florida, Mr. Putnam, to serve as the newest member of the committee. And let me uh, say that uh, I don't know that we do want to give him a round of applause because actually he suffered a great personal loss as well the loss uh, to his district from uh, the uh, the latest uh, hurricane uh, in Florida and so he will not be uh, at today's hearing but we'll look forward to formally welcoming him when uh, when he does return so uh, let me just say uh, for the record that we are very pleased that uh, Adam Putnam from Florida uh, will become the newest member of the uh, Rules Committee and we do congratulate him for that appointment. And obviously, you're thinking about him, especially in light of the uh, loss that he has suffered. Uh, we're here for the uh, consideration of H.J. Res. 106, proposing an amendment to the Constitution of the United States relating to marriage, as well as H.R. 3193, the District of Columbia Personal Protection Act. We'll begin with consideration of H.J. Res. 106. Mr. And, uh, Mr. Chairman. We, Mr. Yes, okay. Mr. McGovern. Uh, has H.J. Res. 106 been reported out of the Judiciary Committee? Uh, no, it has not. Um, has it been reported out of any committee? No, it's, it's not. It's coming straight to the Rules Committee. Well, it just seems to me that a, that a measure of this importance, we're talking about amending the Constitution, and in my opinion, adding a discrimination to the Constitution, that we would want to have the Committee of Jurisdiction uh, work its will on this before, I mean, before bringing it or rushing it to the floor. Is there mm -hmm. a... Is there well, that's a why we're, reason why it has we're, to be in the we're considering it here on the rules committee, and that's the uh, decision that we've made to consider it here. But thank you. So we will proceed uh, with uh, hearing from our colleague Ms. Musgrave, who is the uh, author of uh, this amendment. And uh, without objection, let me say, uh, Ms. Musgrave, any prepared remarks that you have will appear in the record in their entirety, and we uh, welcome your summary. Thank you, welcome. Mr. Chairman. The Marriage Protection Amendment is the reintroduced version of House Res. Uh, 56 with various technical and cosmetic changes to clarify the intent of the bill. All testimony and hearings in both the House and the Senate uh, for H.J. Res. 56 or its companion bills are relevant to H.J. Res. 106 because support for the clarification language was addressed in the hearings. The Marriage Protection Amendment defines marriage and leaves other details to state lawmakers. Uh, the Marriage Protection Amendment is designed to stop the judicial activism while protecting sovereign states' powers on the subject of other than marriage arrangements. H.J. Res. 56 has 130 co-sponsors, 130 sponsors, including myself. I am still in the process of getting uh, the co-sponsors on the new bill today, but it looks like we'll have most, if not all, of the 130 co-sponsors, plus some more by the time the bill comes to the floor. 
I recommend that the amendment be considered on the House floor with a closed rule with no amendments. No other member of Congress has introduced any bill relating to this constitutional amendment issue. There have been at least three hearings on the bill in the House and even more in the Senate on the equivalent text. And uh, that's all I have to say, Mr. Chairman, at this time. Well, thank you very much. We appreciate your statement. Uh, I will tell you that uh, I'm certainly a supporter of traditional marriage, but like a lot of our colleagues, I personally have um, a real difficulty with the idea of amending the Constitution, and it is something that I think should be a last resort, so I just wanted the record to show that I have those concerns, but I have no questions for you. Mr. Linder? I don't have one question. Why doesn't the Defense of Marriage Act suffice? Well, I believe that when we talk about the Defense of Marriage Act, of course, you were probably here when it was signed into law by the President and, and supported by uh, a bipartisan uh, support for the bill. Uh, we're really going beyond uh, full faith and credit issues right now. Uh, due process and equal protection are coming into the discussion on a regular basis. You can look at a state like Nebraska, where a constitutional amendment passed by over 70 percent, and the attorney general of that state uh, thinks that their DOMA is at risk. And I believe also we can look at Goodrich and uh, have an idea of what the Supreme Court will do. So you're anticipating that the Supreme Court may throw out DOMA, but has any court yet in any state, in any jurisdiction, um, thrown out DOMA? It has not been thrown out yet. Uh, I believe most legal scholars agree that it will be. Uh, you know, many of us hoped, I wasn't in Congress at the time, I was in the state legislature, that DOMA would be sufficient. But I believe that uh, recent court rulings uh, indicate that it will not. Uh, we you. also would have a problem of a number of people uh, having uh, same-sex marriages that would want them recognized in other states and have a great deal of confusion. Thank you. Mr. McGovern. Let me, let me ask you, whose, whose marriage are you protecting? You said you're here to protect uh, marriage. I don't need my, you to protect my marriage. My marriage is fine. But So whose marriage are you protecting here? What are we, why are you doing this? I believe that this amendment uh, protects the institution of marriage from being redefined uh, by four justices in the state of Massachusetts. Well, l let me, let me, let me, say to you that uh, as I read your, uh, your, your bill here, that if it were enacted, that it would null and void what happened in Massachusetts. Am I correct on that? There would be a federal definition of marriage. Right. So, so in other words, on May 17th in Massachusetts, uh, according to the state Supreme Judicial Court, that it was legal for same-sex couples to get married. A number did. Uh, a, number had very, a number of people who have lived together for and committed their lives to each other for, for many, many years, uh, got married because it was legal to do in Massachusetts. Now, if you got your way, what would happen to those people who have now been legally married? Would all of a sudden their marriages be null and void? I think that would be sorted out as this goes along, but again, we would have a federal definition of marriage. Well, I mean, I, the, reason why I ask you, the reason why I ask you is because every legal scholar that I have been able to talk to says that in fact, that's what your bill would do. And so, in essence, what, what your bill would do for, at least as it, as it relates to Massachusetts, is actually take away people's rights that have already been given to them. It would be a, you, you'd be adding a discrimination to the United States Constitution. Um, and I guess, I, I don't know of any other time when we've amended the Constitution uh, to basically take away people's rights. Well, we do indeed uh, live in very interesting times when we have four justices in Massachusetts that have recognized same-sex marriage there. Right. However, the will of those justices can be forced on the entire right. nation. We have 38 states that have passed defensive marriage acts. Oh, oh, and I'm, we have 13 I'm, I'm, states uh, considering those right now. I'm well aware of that, but as you also know, Louisiana. in Massachusetts, for example, uh, there is a process that if a majority of the people of Massachusetts do not agree with that decision, there is a way for them to overturn that decision and to add, a, add an amendment to the state constitution. I mean, you're aware of that, and you're aware that, this, that the state legislature, and I disagree with this, but they took the first step toward doing that. So there is a process in Massachusetts, as there is in other states, to deal with this short of amending the Supreme, Supreme Court, of the, uh, short of amending the United States Constitution. 
course, there are lawsuits all over the United States in regard to this issue. Uh, in the state of Massachusetts, unfortunately, it's a very uh, lengthy task that they have in uh, overcoming what these justices have imposed upon the state of Massachusetts and would impose upon the entire nation. Well, I, I, don't, I, I don't know of anybody who's saying that, um, that uh, the Massachusetts decision um, is, is being forced on other states or around, the, around the nation. But I guess my, my point I'm trying to make to you is that there is a process in place, you know, in the state of Massachusetts that gives the people of Massachusetts the opportunity either to agree with what the uh, state Supreme Judicial Court has done or disagree. I mean, that, I mean, you, you're, you, you're, come from, you're from the party that used to champion states' rights, and all of a sudden, here we are, uh, you talking about how bad states' rights are here, and I'm trying to understand why can't the people of Massachusetts decide for themselves what they want to do in Massachusetts? You know, why do you have to come in with this amendment and say that, uh, that you know better and that you're going to make that judgment and you're going to deny the people the right to decide whether to, to, to agree with the state, uh, Supreme Judicial Court decision or disagree with it? Well, actually, uh, Congressman, I have one vote out of 435, and I would remind you that the legislative process, the deliberative process, have, has been available all along for proponents of same-sex marriage. But they've not chosen that route. Uh, they've found sympathetic justices. I believe in the separation of powers, and I believe the legislative branch should be making laws, not the judicial branch. Well, and the legislative branch of Massachusetts has the ability, if it so chooses, to, you know, to amend the Constitution, the Constitution of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. They have that power. They've already taken one step in that direction. I disagreed with what they did, but they have the opportunity to do it again. But if they choose not to amend their Constitution, what you're proposing here would actually null and void what the people of Massachusetts want. Your, your, your approach here would actually take away people's rights that have already been given to them. You, would ha you will have told those couples that have been married in Massachusetts on May 17th and after that um, even though it was legal at one time, we have just taken away your rights. Um, let me just r read to you just uh, uh, Dennis Archer, from the president of the American Bar Association, um, actually sent around a very interesting uh, commentary on, on this whole issue. But one of the things he says is that uh, it has long been recognized that, s that states have authority to regulate marriage and other family-related matters under our federal system. Indeed, we have not only successfully tolerated the fact that state laws governing marriage are not uniform, we have benefited from it. As Justice Brandeis famously described our federal system over 70 years ago, and I quote, it is one of the happy incidents of the federal system that a single courageous state may serve as a laboratory and try novel social experiments without risk to the rest of the country, end quote. He says, your bill here would deprive us of these benefits by curtailing the ability of states to enact diverse marriage laws that reflect unique views of their residents. Specifically, your bill proposes an amendment to the Constitution that would declare that marriage in the, United, in, the, in the United States shall consist only of a union of a man and a woman. Now, I guess we're going to disagree on this, but um, I have to tell you, uh, this is an important issue, uh, not just whether you agree that same-sex couples should have the ability to be married or not. Um, I mean, this, this has significant implications with regard to the Constitution. The fact that this legislation is before us without having been reported out of the Committee of Jurisdiction is being rushed to the floor, um, kind of on the eve of an election, kind of smacks of election politics. I agree with the Chairman of the Rules Committee, uh, Mr. Dreyer, that uh, it, we should be very careful how we amend one of the most sacred documents our, in, in our country. I also I find myself agreeing with a lot of Republicans these days. Chris Cox, Congressman from California, had a very um, compelling op-ed piece today uh, in the Wall Street Journal saying the marriage amendment is a terrible idea. Um, I agree with that title. I think this is a terrible idea. I don't, I don't think we should be wasting our time doing this on the House floor. And um, quite frankly, um, I think you should uh, respect the will of the people of Massachusetts and let them decide what's best for them. And, and people from Colorado or Georgia or any other state shouldn't be dictating to us uh, nor should I be dictating to any other state uh, on these kinds of matters. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mrs. Myers. No, I don't have any questions.
questions of the general lady. I just thank her for being here today. I thank the chairman. Uh, I appreciate the gentlewoman bringing this important issue before this committee, and I look forward to the vote in this committee and also on the floor. And I thank you for your hard work. You're welcome. Mr. Adams, I have no questions, gentlemen. Thank you very much for being here. We thank you, Mr. Chairman. Our next witness is uh, the gentleman from Indiana, Mr. Hostetler. Uh, please uh, come forward, and without objection, any prepared remarks that you have will. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Uh, it is with some reluctance uh, that I bring five amendments before you tonight. I say with reluctance because it had been my desire to sort these issues out before the Constitution Subcommittee or even the full Judiciary Committee. Marriage is a serious issue, and the issue of preserving a marriage as the union of one man and one woman is a serious issue underneath that. My amendments concern only two issues, the federalization of domestic relations and preserving the incidence of marriage for marriage. First, let me address the issue of the federalization of domestic relations law. By setting forth marriage in the Constitution, we may well be setting forth a basis upon which some future Congress, or more likely the federal courts, may claim the ability to enter into all forms of domestic relations law. That is why I believe it is imperative that this amendment contain the phrase, quote, nothing in this amendment grants any new legislative authority to the Congress of the United States or any new judicial power to the Supreme Court of the United States or any court created by Congress. This is essentially the substance of amendment number two. The authors of this amendment contend that they have two goals. First, it is their desire to prohibit courts from granting the incidence of marriage to unmarried couples, presumably those in civil unions or domestic partnerships. I contend that here they have simply failed. They have failed because in introducing H.J. Res 106, they have only restricted the courts from construing state or federal constitutions to grant the incidents. Hence, any court, for any reason short of a constitutional one, may simply grant the incidents of marriage to unmarried couples, and this amendment will, will not stop them. My amendment number three simply reinstates the phrase, no state or federal law. At this point, one might say, shouldn't we match our amendment to that voted on in the Senate? And my response is, why? That amendment did not even obtain a majority of votes for cloture. As I said, the authors of this amendment have two goals concerning the instance of marriage, the first being stopping the courts. The second goal is to allow, yes, allow the legislatures and the states to enact civil unions or domestic partnership laws. I those, ask those of you from California what this amendment does for you. The answer is nothing. Your domestic partner law in California is unaffected by this amendment. You see, we are doing very little except to protect the name or term marriage. My amendment number one would prohibit both state and federal legislatures as well as the courts from imposing civil unions. The spousal relationship is key to preserving marriage. It is the common denominator between civil unions and marriage. Limit the spousal relationship to marriage and you will truly protect the institution of marriage. If this is too much for you today, I urge you to consider my amendment number four. As I've stated, this second sentence as it is currently drafted, neither stops courts from granting the incidence of marriage to unmarried couples, nor does it stop legislatures. The current sentence might indeed give some pause to some courts in a limited set of circumstances, but we do not need a constitutional amendment to deal with the courts in those circumstances. The executive and legislative branches already at the state and federal level have ample constitutional means to deal with the judiciary. Finally, I have submitted amendment number five. If we truly want to do this right, I submit that we define marriage as being between a man and a woman. We limit the spousal relationship to being between one man and one woman, and we make sure that in light of this, we do not inadvertently federalize domestic relations law. Let me conclude. Simply protecting the term marriage is not enough. Marriage by any name is marriage, whether we call it civil unions or domestic partnerships. Marriage is too important to be only about semantics. We must also be cognizant that while we may today be talking about same-sex marriage, someday in the future we may be laying the groundwork for all ma marriage issues to become, federable, to, to become federal. We must not allow this to happen, I re and I respectfully urge you to support my amendments. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Hostetler. Uh, Mr. Linder? No questions. Thank you very much. Mr. Frost? No questions. Mrs. Myrick? No questions. Mr. McGovern? 
No, other than to say that I think you raised some interesting points. I think I disagree with all the points you've raised, but uh, but I think you I agree with one thing, and and that is um, amending the Constitution uh, needs to be done very carefully, um, if at all. And I think you raised some interesting questions that, uh, quite frankly, should have been discussed and debated in the appropriate committee, the Judiciary Committee. And it is astounding to me that on a matter of amending the United States Constitution, I mean the most sacred document in the land that we have, that, uh, you know, that it wasn't reported out of the committee, um, that this bill that we're uh, discussing today, this, the, the form of the amendment was not a product of your work um, and others on the committee, um, that we're just kind of bringing this to the floor. I, I think that's not the way this is supposed to be done. I don't know, you're on the Judiciary Committee, I mean, isn't that what you're supposed to do on the Judiciary Committee is to, uh, deliberate on these issues and to amend them and, and make these things better and, and clarify the definitions? Is, isn't that what is supposed to happen? The Judiciary Committee spent a significant amount of time on this issue with uh, uh, several hearings. Uh, uh, I would have liked to have uh, been, been part of the process. Of well, I, I, th I think among, in addition to hearings, you're supposed to mark up a bill and report it out. Um, and um, and it, it appears that that didn't happen in this case. Um, it did not in this right. Case. Well, that's unfortunate, and um, again, I, I think you know, I think it's a mistake to amend the Constitution. But if you're going to bring something like this to the floor, um, I think at a minimum, uh, the Committee of Jurisdiction should do its job and deliberate, um, and every member should have an opportunity to, to deliberate and offer their amendments before it comes to the Rules Committee. And I thank the gentleman for for being here. being here, Mr. Hostiller. We appreciate it. Our next witness is the gentleman from New York, Mr. Nadler. Nice to see you. Please uh, come forward. And any prepared statement that you have will, uh, without objection, appear in the record in its entirety. And we welcome your summary. Well, thank you. I've been asked by your staff to draw the microphone closer. <laughs> is that close enough? Wherever the, uh, okay, he's nodding. Yes. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, today, the drumbeat of political demagoguery has reached its crescendo. As the House prepares to consider an amendment to the United States Constitution ma banning marriage between persons of the same gender. I have not submitted any amendments. I'm not aware of any other than those of Mr. Hostetler. And I'm not, seeking he I'm not here seeking to have any amendments made in order. I don't think this am proposed amendment can be salvaged. It doesn't belong in our Constitution. It is unworthy of this great nation and the Senate couldn't even muster a simple majority to consider a version of it, much less the requisite two-thirds to adopt it. This is a new version of the amendment. As Mr. McGovern noted, it wasn't even introduced until the end of last week. Although this issue has been the subject of four hearings in the Judiciary Committee, this proposed amendment and its, and its potential impact on the state marriage laws has not. We've only considered a different version of a similar amendment at one hearing. When the sponsor of this amendment appeared before the Constitution Subcommittee, which I'm the, on which I'm the ranking minority member, she was not prepared to comment on a similar version or any version other than the one she had introduced at that time. And to contrary to what she said, these are not simply technical changes between the earlier version and this version. As Mr. Hostetler's comments demonstrate, there are serious differences between the earlier version of this amendment and this amendment and this draft. Their implications have not been explored. They've not been explored at any hearing. They've not been explored at any markup. And it is uh, uh, amazing to me that the leadership of the House would bring this amendment to the floor with, through this committee without going through the Committee of Jurisdiction, through the Subcommittee on the Constitution, through the Judiciary Committee, which is why the committee exists after all. We have not marked up this amendment either in committee or subcommittee. Although the designation of the oak tree as our national tree has merited such careful consideration, our deliberations seem uh, to be reserved for important subjects. What's the Constitution between friends, after all? As the ranking member of the Constitution Subcommittee, I'm normally called upon to explain proposed constitutional amendments. This one requires some extra effort to do so. From what precisely would this amendment protect marriage? From no-fault divorce? from legalized fornication, from the failure of states to incarcerate adulterers, perhaps? No. Evidently, the threat to marriage is the fact that there are thousands of people in this country who very much believe in marriage, 
who very much want to marry, who may not marry under the laws of this country and whose fellow citizens may one day vote per to permit them to do so, or may not, depending. I've been searching in vain for some indication of what might happen to my marriage or to the marriage of anyone in this room if loving couples, including couples who now have children, are permitted to enjoy the blessings of matrimony. If there is a member of this committee who believes that their own marriage would be destabilized or destroyed by a same-sex marriage on the part of some other couple somewhere in the United States, I'd welcome an explanation as to what you think would happen to your marriage and why. Any takers? The, overhead, the overheated rhetoric we've been hearing on this subject is reminiscent of the bellicose fear-mongering that followed the Supreme Court's decision in 1967 in Loving versus Virginia, which struck down state prohibitions against interracial marriages. The Supreme Court, we were told by many members of this House and of the Senate, had overstepped its authority. The Supreme Court had overridden the democratic will of the majority. The Supreme Court had signed a death warrant for all that is good and pure in this nation. Fortunately, we survived as a nation, and we are better for that Supreme Court decision. In the not too, decent, too distant future, I should say, people will look back on these debates with the same incredulity we now view the segregationist debates of years past. I must say also that it is amazing to me to see an amendment that this committee will probably bring to the floor of the House designed not to deal with some shortcoming in the law as it exists, not to deal with a Supreme Court opinion that the authors of the amendment disagree with, but to deal with the law that might occur if the Supreme Court were to issue a decision which it hasn't issued, which no court has issued, with a case that isn't even going up on appeal. This, this, this amendment is designed purely to deal with a hypothetical judicial decision. We have never in our history passed a, an amendment to the United States Constitution to deal with hypothetical court decisions. I remember Ms. Musgrave as a state legislator sitting and testifying before the Judiciary Committee when we were considering the Defense of Marriage Act a number of years ago that that, amend, that, that act was constitutional. Now she's apparently changed her mind. She thinks it's unconstitutional, although no court has held that. No court at any level has held the Defense of Marriage Act unconstitutional, and certainly not the Supreme Court, and there's no decision pending. So why are we even worried about this? And this amendment does more than it purports to do. It would preempt any state law, preempt any state law allowing people of the same gender to marry, even if that law was adopted by the legislature or by referendum, not imposed by the courts. Read the first sentence of the amendment. Any such marriage would be unconstitutional even if the people of the state by referendum or as represented in the legislature decided to make it legal in that state. This amendment says nothing about recognition of marriages from one state to another. The sub it's alleged subject. If you want to allow democratic majorities to have their way within their own borders, this amendment will do the exact opposite. There are many loving families who deserve the benefits and protections of the law. They don't live just in New York or San Francisco or Boston. They live in every one of the 435 congressional districts in the United States. They are not from out of space. They are not a public menace, and they don't threaten anyone. They are our neighbors, our coworkers, our friends, our siblings, parents, and children. They deserve to be fa treated fairly. They deserve to have the same rights as every other family. That's my personal opinion. Were I a state legislator, as I used to be, I would vote to permit same-sex marriages in my state. But that's not the question before us. The question is, should we amend the United States Constitution to deal with a non-existent court decision from a non-existent court case that would perhaps declare legislation that we have passed, that I disapproved of, I voted against it, but we passed it, it's the law of the land. This amendment is designed to, to deal with a hypothetical court decision uh, declaring that legislation unconstitutional, and it is designed to, although the author will not admit it, prohibit any state, not just any state court, but any state by referendum or by legislative action from doing what the author of this amendment disapproves of, namely allowing a same-sex marriage or perhaps a same-sex civil union or perhaps just domestic partnership. It's not at all clear uh, in that state. And again, this amendment is not clear what it would do. Would it apply only to civil union, to, to same-sex marriages or also to civil unions or also to domestic partnership arrangements of one sort or another? It's not clear. And the reason it's not clear is that this amendment has not been properly vetted. We have had no hearings on it.
We've had hearings on the general subject matter, but no hearings on this amendment as drafted to see what does the language mean? What does the language introduced last week actually mean for state laws? I regret the debate we're about to have. It saddens me that this great institution would sink to these depths even on the eve of an election. And I hope that this committee will not, frankly, uh, arrogate to itself the role of the Judiciary Committee and report this amendment straight to the floor. I fail to see the urgency of why this amendment cannot be properly considered before the Constitution Subcommittee and the Constitution, if we take our, and the Judiciary Committee, if we take our Constitution seriously, then this amendment should be properly vetted, should be the subject of hearings. We should understand, before the Judiciary Committee, we should understand what it will do and what it won't do, or at least hear opinions on those questions. They may differ before we actually consider it on the floor. Thank you very much, Mr. You. Nadler. We appreciate it. Mr. Linder. No questions. Thank you. Mr. Frost. Uh, Mr. Nadler, you, uh, you mentioned one thing, and I just want to make sure that everyone's clear on this, because I, I read the language of this amendment, and it appears that the amendment would preclude civil unions. And was that your testimony? My testimony is that it, it, you could argue that both ways, and that's the problem. I could see a good lawyer arguing that it does, and I could see a, some lawyers arguing that it doesn't. It is, as far as I can tell, unclear. And if you're amending the Constitution, you ought to have clarity of language and clarity of purpose. And that's what, one of the reasons I said this really ought to be vetted by the Judiciary Committee, by our normal process, we ought to hold hearings and clarify that point, among others. So you said a good lawyer and some lawyers. So what, what would that uh, be? So which side would they? Well, not all lawyers are good lawyers, okay. though I hate to admit that. I may, re may reclaim, reclaim my time. Uh, <laughs> the specific language that we're talking about here, Jerry, is the second sentence in this amendment. Neither this Constitution nor the Constitution of any state shall be construed to require that marriage or the legal incidents thereof be conferred upon any union other than the union of a man and a woman. There are some states and some uh, that have uh, examined the issue of civil union, which is not marriage, but which would provide for uh, the right to visit a sick person in the hospital, the right to inherit, uh, the right to have insurance for that person. Um, and it appears, just from a reading of the language, it's on the back, uh, that it would be difficult, if not impossible, to have those benefits that flow to a couple in a civil union, even if the state did not call this marriage, even if it were not I, a marriage. I would agree that a court might read it that way. Uh, it also might not. The question is, what does the legal incidence thereof mean? That's undefined. As far as I know, there's no, uh, no court, uh, there's no legislative history on that question. Mm -hmm. There is no uh, uh, legal history whatsoever on the question of what do those words mean? What are the legal incidents of marriage? Uh, that's why I said a good lawyer could argue it either, not even a good lawyer, any lawyer right. could argue, <laughs> to satisfy Mr. Dry, could argue both sides of that question. It's why I said that... Um, uh, Be conferred uh, upon any union because states have attempted to deal Clear. with the, the issue of civil unions short of marriage. And not just civil unions, but domestic partnerships. A lot of domestic, mm -hmm. you could certainly argue in court uh, that, well, the, the civil union provisions of this state are enacted in its legislature, or even the domestic partnerships provisions of this state uh, uh, enacted by its legislature or enacted by referendum. Well. What does marriage mean? Marriage means A, B, C, D, E, F. This in, 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 in state X, civil union means A, B, C, D. Doesn't mean E and F. That's, that's pretty much, and if well, it looks like a duck, quacks like a duck, maybe that's marriage, the, and the court might decide that. Specifically, there are some very conservative high-tech companies in my state of Texas, as well as in other states, that have broadened their insurance policies to permit the partner of uh, one of their employees to be covered under their insurance. And they did that to be able to retain uh, some very talented, uh, competent people to work for their business. And uh, I think that you, you, you raise an interesting issue about the vagueness of the language. And it is not clear uh, whether those kind of situations would, in fact, be precluded uh, under this amendment as written. It, th this amendment as written is unclear in many ways. That's, that's number one. Uh, what does the legal incidence thereof mean? 
as I said, normally when you have language, sometimes you have language of art and you have a long history of, of, of statutory use of court interpretation. There is none here. There's no basis for deciding what that means. There's not even the hearings before the committee to decide what that means, uh, to give any court any guidance through legislative history. Uh, certainly, if we were doing this properly and we were thinking seriously of passing this, of course it's not going to pass, uh, given what the Senate did, but it may, it may in some future Congress. But if this was serious, if, if this weren't just political demagoguery, uh, we would want to have hearings in front of the Judiciary Committee and explore that question if only to perhaps change the language or perhaps or to establish legislative history to guide a court that's the first thing second thing is the first sentence seems to contradict the second sentence second sentence says neither this constitution nor the constitution of any state shall be construed to require and the intent of that is to i gather and it uh, is to is to say that the, the courts shall not impose same-sex marriage but a legislature can Presumably, that's, the, that's why it says neither constitution shall be construed. It doesn't say no one can establish it. And yet the first sentence says marriage in the United States shall consist solely of the union of a man and a woman. Unless the legislature says otherwise, as I said, there seems to be a contradiction between the first and second sentences. If we were doing this properly, we would have hearings and we would draft the amendment in such a way that the first sentence didn't seem to contradict the second sentence and that it was clear what it meant. Either this means that a legislature can allow same-sex marriage in a state or it doesn't. Be, be clear what you mean. Either it means that civil unions or certain benefits, whatever you call it, such as the high-tech company or, or let's say a state legislature said that any, uh, that any, uh, uh, any health uh, benefits that we're going to get a tax break in a state had to apply to domestic partners or whatever. Uh, is that forbidden, prohibited by this also, or is it not? I think an amendment to the Constitution ought to be clear what it means, and right here we have no idea what this means in these, and, and these, the only, these, these uh, major respects. The only other point I would make is that uh, this does not appear to be a strictly partisan issue in the House of Representatives. The chairman of this committee, a Republican member, uh, as I, I understand his position, is opposed to this amendment as written. Uh, Chris Cox, a Republican member from California, is opposed to this amendment as written. Um, this, is, this is not just a lineup, put the Republicans on one side and the Democrats on the other side. There are, there are people in both parties who have some questions about uh, the proceeding that we're undertaking today. Well, I agree with you. I think there are people in both parties who have disagreed. Whether you support gay marriage is one question. Another question is, if you don't support gay marriage, should you amend the Constitution uh, for the first time ever to discriminate, or should you amend the Constitution on the subject at all? Third question is, if you're going to amend the Constitution, shouldn't you have a competent amendment drafted that does what you want to do and that people are clear what they're voting on and what it does say and what it doesn't say? A fourth question is, in order to achieve that, shouldn't you use the normal processes of the House and have hearings before the proper committee and have a markup before the proper committee so that Mr. Hostetler doesn't sit here and say, well, these are amendments that no one thought of before and we should bring them to the floor. Frankly, this is a travesty in terms of the process of amending the Constitution of the United States. There's no document more important on a civil basis. One can argue the Bible is more important on a religious basis, but on a civil basis, there is no, no document more important to us than the Constitution of the United States, and we should not trifle with it lightly and without careful consideration. So my urge, I urge this committee um, not to report a rule for this amendment to the floor and send it to the Judiciary Committee to deal with it properly. And, uh, Mr. Nadler, you may have already talked about this, but it's, uh, of course, my recollection that the Vice President of the United States, Mr. Cheney, has expressed on several occasions uh, serious reservations uh, about this amendment. He has expressed, as I recall from the news, I think he's expressed opposition to this amendment, although the President obviously has not. Um, but, but Mr. Cheney, the Vice President, has. But again, that isn't even the question before this committee. I mean, that's one of the questions. But the real question before this committee, this committee is the Rules Committee of the House. The Rules Committee of the House, on a matter of this import, ought to say, regardless of the partisanship, regardless of the politics, regardless uh, of, of, of how people feel about the merits of the, of the, of, of the subject, that we oughtn't to trifle with the Constitution lightly. The rules ought to be followed, the procedures ought to be followed, this ought to be referred to the Judiciary Committee to act properly on it. And maybe it'll come back here from the Judiciary Committee at some point. 
Uh, and maybe at that point we'll have a legislative history as to what it means. Maybe it'll be changed in its wording. Uh, maybe it'll be clearer. Uh, maybe it won't come back. Maybe the Judiciary Committee its wisdom will say this is a bad idea. But um, frankly, the procedure should be followed because it's the Constitution we're dealing with. And a, a transient partisan uh, uh, or nonpartisan, I don't know what the point is, a transient uh, headline uh, is not worth this. No questions, uh, Mr. Chairman. I look forward to uh, reading your testimony. Did you bring your testimony in writing? Because I look forward to reading it. I, I just I, got I, here. I brought an outline of it. I've gone considerably further, but yes. Well, I would, I would yeah. appreciate it if you give me a copy because I do, I sure. would read it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first, I want to thank you for your, your testimony. You and Mr. Hostetler agree on one thing, and that is that this is a badly drafted amendment. Um, and, um, I mean, it's subject to all kinds of interpretations. Uh, we don't know the full implications of what would happen if this actually made it all the way uh, and became an, an amendment to the Constitution. Uh, I think the exchange between you and Mr. Frost is also very important to highlight that, there, that this, this may not just be about marriage, this may be about benefits that companies are already providing uh, to couples. This may be about civil unions, we don't know. But the bottom line is uh, no one who, who is a proponent of this legislation can give you a straight answer because they don't know the answer to that. So I, I think that goes to the point that you had said before about the fact that this committee should reject this, um, send it back to the Judiciary Committee, let the Judiciary Committee do its work. Secondly, I want to point out, since I'm the only one up here from Massachusetts, that there is a process uh, that the states have to deal with this issue. Um, People who do not like what the Massachusetts uh, State Supreme Judicial Court decided um, should know that there is a process in Massachusetts where people um, and, leg and the legislators can amend the Constitution, can change that. Um, and it is a process that is part of our Constitution, one of the, old the oldest Constitution uh, in, the in the United States, written by John Adams, uh, one of the founders of our, of our country. Um, and I think uh, I think old federalists. Right, right, absolutely. Found, the founders of federalists. We, we should we should we should uh, we should give him a little bit more credit for having uh, drafted a good constitution and um, and to approach some of these subjects very carefully and delicately and thoughtfully. And that's not what we're doing here right now. Well, I, I certainly agree with you. Let me let me just say there is no urgent. What, what is so astounding to me on this is that why we are short-circuiting the procedure that has served as well for a couple hundred years, and we're doing it when there is absolutely no urgency. There's no urgency for several reasons. Number one, the Senate has rejected it. This amendment is going nowhere this year. We have time if we want to do it. I don't, but if the House wants to do it, we have time to do it right, because the Senate's already voted no by a, by a majority. It's not going to pass this year. Number two, if it goes to next year, and we have hearings, and, we, and, and the Judiciary Committee does its, does its thing and it reports an amendment, maybe this one, maybe with better drafted or whatever. We have ample time to consider it because, as I said, there is no court decision. There's not even any pending court case in any appellate court that threatens the necessity for this. Uh, the alleged necessity for this amendment is that the Defense of Marriage Act will be declared unconstitutional. Well, maybe it will and maybe it won't but it will take several years before it happens because there's no pending case. Right. So what is the rush to get this on the House floor next week without proper consideration, without having uh, a, a properly drafted amendment, even, even if you agree with the amendment, having it properly drafted so the first sentence doesn't seem to contradict the second sentence, and the second sentence isn't mysterious as to what it means? I think, sadly, the answer to that question is November 2nd, um, that there are some people who I think view this as a, as a political football, which I think is cynical and unfortunate. Um, well, I, I agree. And I, my understanding is that the majority leader of the House, uh, Mr. DeLay, is going to be um, managing this bill when it comes to the floor. So that gives you an indication of, of, of what's behind this. But anyway, I thank you very much for well, your... Thank you. That, that may very well be, but I would hope that this committee, whatever the politics, would respect the Constitution of the United States enough to do the right thing and send this to the Judiciary Committee with instructions to consider it properly. Thank you. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And our next witness is a gentleman from uh, Texas, uh, Ms. Jackson Lee.
And she does not appear to be here, but we uh, certainly will keep the record open if she would like to submit a statement for the record. That will conclude the hearing on H.J. Res. 106. Now we'll proceed with consideration of H.R. 3195, the District of Columbia Personal Protection Act. And we're happy to uh, welcome from the Committee on Government Reform our friend from Indiana, Mr. Souter. Please come forward. We're very pleased to have you. And without objection, your prepared statement will appear in the record in its entirety. Thank you very much. And let me just uh, address a few of the highlights of that statement. Uh, Washington, D.C., citizens are prevented from owning a handgun at all. Even those who lawfully own and store a rifle or shotgun are prohibited from using them to defend their lives, families, and homes. District law threatens honest people with imprisonment if they unlock, assemble, or load their guns, even when under attack. For this reason, I am bringing before you today a bill that would restore the Second Amendment right to D.C. citizens. It's also important to note that my bill would not repeal any provision of D.C. law that bans gun possessions by criminals or punishes violent crime. In the last 13 years, in 13 years between 87 and 2000, Washington, D.C. was the murder capital of the United States. They went one year off, and in 2002, they were again the murder capital of the United States, 14 of the last 15 years. Uh, in the first 15 years, the law murder went up 200 percent in D.C., uh, as opposed to 12 percent in the rest of the United States. Fortunately for the residents of D.C., when Congress chose to delegate home rule to the district in the 1970s, it specified that legislation made by the D.C. Consul, quote, must be consistent with the Constitution of the United States and reserve the right at any time to exercise its constitutional authority for legislating with the district. Now, let me just highlight a couple of things in the bill. First, the bill prohibits the district from prohibiting residents from possessing a firearm that is legal for them to possess under federal law. Second, the bill would bring the district's definition of a machine gun into conformity with federal law and the laws of the states. Third, the bill eliminates the district's firearm registration requirement and logically eliminates the penalty for possession of an unregistered firearm. Fourth, the bill eliminates the district's ban on private possession of handguns and handgun ammunition. And fifth, the bill eliminates the district's ban on the use of firearms for protection at home. To sum up, the U.S. Constitution, the Constitution of 44 states, federal law, the laws of all 50 states, and the vast majority of Americans recognize the right to use firearms for personal protection. Only the District of Columbia prohibits a person from having a firearm assembled and loaded at home for the purpose of self-defense. This needs to change. As you know, I also have a clarifying amendment at your desk, and in my opinion, it is indeed a clarifying amendment. Three times in the bill, we state that the purpose is to protect your homes, business, or land that you may possess, but to make sure that people can't carry rifles and shotguns outside their home, uh, we have a te technical amendment here that clarifies, again, that it only pertains to handguns and rifles at home or on your own property. And let me make a, a brief comment in a little bit more blunt fashion than, than some may have that may address one of the questions that comes up here. First, let me talk about jurisdiction. Uh, government reform has jurisdiction. Uh, it is not clear what subcommittee has jurisdiction. If there is a subcommittee there, it would be mine. Criminal justice, it's drug policy, criminal justice, and human resources. D.C. matters are generally kept at the full committee. I'm one of the senior members of that committee. As this committee knows, uh, Chairman Davis opposes this bill. Uh, he, he and I have worked this through for an extended period of time. The fact is my bill has 229 co-sponsors, not just a lot of co-sponsors, the majority of the United States Congress. Forty-four of those co-sponsors are from the other side, fully 25 percent of the other party. It's bipartisan. A question of timing is likely to come up. We've heard people say this is a surprise. I'm sorry, you can't have a surprise on a bill. My bill was introduced. We've been adding sponsors week by week. I go down to the well and put them in. I have a Democratic co-sponsor, Mr. Ross of Arkansas, who's been recruiting Democrats. NRA has been mailing around the nation, which is why members were getting on my bill, because they were getting letters in their offices. How this can be a surprise, as opposed to people being asleep, is highly questionable. Secondly, as far as the timing, I was held to a standard that I believe other members are not held to. I had to get to a hard 218 co-sponsors before my bill would come up. 
I would have been happy to have this bill early in the year. I would have been happy to have this bill earlier in June and July because we could have headed off some of the publicity off of the assault weapons ban because it's clear not only weren't we going to change the assault weapons ban, we had a clear majority of Congress to repeal this legislation. The fact is, is the leadership held me to a standard of 218. Furthermore, in working with Mr. Davis, I had to show that I had a full majority of the relevant committee. In other words, unless Chairman Davis felt that he was going to lose a vote, he didn't need, uh, he didn't need, he could, he didn't have to bring the bill. But once it became clear in late July and into September that not only did we have a clear majority of the House, but a clear majority of the committee that was going to hold the line on every single amendment and move forward, then the leadership uh, agreed to move the bill. That was not accomplished until late July. I would have preferred this came up even earlier or even earlier in September, but that's how we got here at the table at this time, and I hope the Rules Committee will both uh, uh, move the bill forward as well as the uh, clarifying amendment. Thank you very much. Yeah, one question. Do you have any concerns that um, future Congresses might meddle in other communities' activities, such as there are two or three or four communities around the country where local legislation has passed a statute that you have to have a gun in your home. And actually, the facts are that the crime has gone down in those communities. Do you worry that future Congresses might reverse those? Well, it, it comes to a, a fundamental question of which, uh, in my opinion, we fought a civil war over, and that is when you have a constitution and when there are federal laws, does the federal law take supremacy over local laws? Uh, as a northerner and a Lincoln person, I've uh, stated, and I believe some people misunderstood what I was stating, that uh, the District of Columbia allowed the selling of slaves, and the federal Congress overrode that and said you can't sell slaves because it's unconstitutional, because after the southerners left the Congress, there was a majority of the North left. When South Carolina tried to secede from the Union, we said the federal law superseded state law. If there is a constitutional provision, we go through this in the uh, legalization of marijuana debates, the Supreme Court has upheld multiple times that a constitutional right that's, that's granted can't be overridden, and when there's federal legislation, it can't be overridden. So if a local community violated the Constitution by taking a, a protection away, then they would have to fear the United States Congress. But if the example you're talking about is not reducing a constitutional right, it would be expanding. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, well, I, I personally believe that Washington should be able to set its own gun control laws, um, to be honest with you. Um, and I don't think you should. Um, and I think that's why I think this is a, a bad bill. But you had mentioned um, in the beginning of your testimony that, uh, that, that somehow D.C.'s gun laws violate the Second Amendment. Um, I'm going to differ with you. In a recent NRA-inspired lawsuit, D.C. citizens challenged the constitutionality of the city's gun laws. In a decision made early this year, uh, Seegers versus Ashcroft, a D.C. federal court judge found that the D.C. gun laws did not violate the plaintiff's Second Amendment rights. In fact, because the Second Amendment specifically applies to state militias, uh, the court held that the amendment cannot apply to the District of Columbia, which is not a state. I mean, that, that's just a recent uh, case that actually um, contradicts what you said. I also want to read, for the record, uh, the, uh, the letter that Chairman Davis um, and Ranking Member Waxman sent to all of us. It says, Dear colleague, we are writing to urge you to oppose H.R. 3193, a bill that would make Washington, D.C. less safe. H.R. 3193 falls within the jurisdiction of the Government Reform Committee, but was not considered by the committee. H.R. 3193 repeals the D.C. laws that restrict the possession of firearms in the District of Columbia. Among the laws repealed are the ban on semi-automatic semi assault weapons, the ban on armor-piercing cop killer ammunition, and the gun registration requirements. Although one can debate the merits of some of D.C.'s gun laws, no one should question the importance of keeping fully loaded assault weapons off the streets of the nation's capital. Another problem with, with H.R. 3193 uh, is its impact on home rule for the district. Congress would never act to repeal the gun laws for communities in Northern Virginia or Southern California. Whether we agree or disagree with the district's laws, we should accord the mayor and the D.C. City Council the same respect. Please join us in voting no on H.R. 3193. Sincerely, Tom Davis, Chairman, and Henry A. Waxman, Ranking uh, Minority Member. 
Um, and uh, I see that uh, my co our colleague Carolyn McCarthy is here. She's also sent, I, I, I'm not going to read what she's sent around to us, but some very um, kind of compelling reasons why we should, we should vote against this. I, you know, this is, uh, this is just a bad idea. Um, and, um, and again, I don't think we should be, uh, I, don't, I don't think this is the kind of stuff we should be talking about during the last, uh, or debating during the last week of, uh, of our session here, the last two weeks of our session. There are more important things for us to be doing. And uh, I, I regret that the gentleman has felt that his cause to, to bring this uh, to this committee and, and before the House, and I hope that we reject it. Well, as, it, as the gentleman knows uh, on a couple of those points, one is, as I stated in my clarifying amendment, I don't believe people should be taking shotguns and, and arm around the city either, uh, or in subways, uh, as happened in the case of, uh, of New York. Uh, the bill clearly states in three different places what the intent of the bill is, and I think clarifying amendment will, will clarify that matter. As I also explained that uh, not only uh, did we have the majority of the committee, we had a number of Mr. Waxman's well, members on the government reform committee who supported this, and we would have easily been able to well, bring I, it out of committee with that. And one last comment, because you said I was incorrect. As you know, it was not a Supreme Court uh, ruling. Uh, uh, it was a district court ruling. Uh, as you also know, that members of Congress can disagree at times, and we have many debates on both sides yeah. of the aisle as to whether well, courts have followed the correct constitutional provision. And of course, the Congress has a right to clarify when we disagree with the district court. Well, I think the most compelling line in the letter from, Mr. D uh, from Chairman Davis and Ranking Member Waxman is that uh, Congress would never act to repeal the gun laws for communities in Northern Virginia or Southern California. And whether we agree or disagree with the district's laws, we should accord the mayor and the D.C. City Council the same respect. And I guess the, my question to you is, you know, why aren't you according uh, the leaders of the District of Columbia, including the delegate who is here, the same respect uh, that you would accord others? I think that there's a couple answers to that question. One is, is that uh, the District of Columbia has the most egregious ban and has been the biggest failure in the United States and clearly shows that, in fact, banning handguns has deprived the guns from the hands of innocents trying to defend their home as opposed to the criminals. And if there's ever been an example of the NRA poster, this is it. Secondly, other laws that are less egregious in other cities and towns, quite frankly, I believe are unconstitutional as well. If there's their narrow limitations, obviously you can limit a gun going into district court, you can limit it at the Capitol building, but when you do blanket limitations, just like the freedom of press, if a local community says that a one newspaper that has been stirring up treason is going to be banned, that's one thing. But if they try to take an entire constitutional right away, of course Congress should act when an entire constitutional right is wiped out by a well, jurisdiction, no matter what the jurisdiction yeah, well, is, if it's broad. Well, but there are no other broad examples no, of this no, law well, you, except for D.C. I think we're just going to uh, we're going to, we're going to, I mean, I, I want to, I think we should respect the people of the District of Columbia and their elected leaders, um, and you're not going to convince me um, that putting more guns on the street uh, is going to decrease gun violence uh, in this city. Too many people have died from gun violence, so I, I, I just disagree with you. Um, I yield. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just want to note uh, there is reference made to Chairman Davis, uh, of the Chairman of the Committee on Government Reform, and he did send a letter to the Rules Committee uh, stating that he is opposed to legislation but asking us to uh, put out an appropriate rule. So uh, if that's not part of the record, Mr. Chairman, I'd ask that that be part of the record. Thank you. May I make an additional comment with Chairman Davis? About Chair may I make additional comment about Chairman Davis? We have been very open about our discussion all through this process. And we have tremendous mutual expect, respect for each other even when we disagree. He knew exactly where we were, where we were in each member, and knew when I passed the majority of the committee. Thank you. We appreciate it. Our next witness is the uh, gentlewoman from the District of Columbia, our friend uh, Ms. Holmes Norton. Please come forward, and without objection, your prepared statement will appear in the record. We've been given a copy of an amendment that you uh, are proposing here. And, uh, Mr. Ch Mr. Chairman, while, while she's getting ready, can I ask unanimous consent to submit the uh, statement of Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lee on H.J. Res. 106? Without objection, uh, Ms. Jackson Lee's Thank statement you. will appear in the record. Thank you. Ms. Holmes Norton, and you might want to take the microphone a little closer there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I suppose, folks, uh, people in the District of Columbia are asking the same question that Representative Souders' hometown newspaper in Fort Wayne asked, where are 
Souter's priorities. Uh, they asked that question in a stinging editorial, uh, which said that the people of the District of Columbia ought to decide the criminal laws in their own local jurisdiction. Uh, Mr. Chairman, a rather unprecedented visit today. Seldom uh, does the mayor of the city, the police chief of the city, and the new superintendent of schools think that all three of them should come up here together. That's what they did today. They have been joined by our business community, not alone businesses in the District of Columbia, but the Greater Washington Board of Trade, which represents all the big and small businesses in the District of Columbia, Maryland, and Virginia. They've been joined by the parents, the relatives of victims, um, uh, who are asking how could the Congress even think about repealing the district's gun law, particularly this summer. We, we are very proud of what our mayor and our police chief have done in recent years. This year alone, for example, homicides are down 25%. Um, we are stunned, stunned. Every oar is in the water, every sector, every ward our wealthiest white wards, our wards across the Anacostia where our poorest residents live and where most of the gun violence is, they're joined together in a circle around this Congress, stunned that in the year, in the, the year when we have had more children killed by gunfire in the first five months than we have in any recent year, that the Congress would even consider a bill that would repeal our gun laws. Um, Mr. Chairman, uh, they, they are calling this in, in, in the district the year of the uh, gun child killings because on the one hand, homicides are down remarkably and yet we've had this horrific spike in children getting a hold of guns. Can you imagine guns in homes in a city like this where children and others would not quickly get them? The police chief said they would make them their way to the streets before you could snap your fingers even if law-abiding law residents were those who had the guns. Citizens uh, are up in arms, if I may b borrow a metaphor. They, they understand that the Congress may be in disagreement uh, with us on many issues. They think that a bill to repeal our gun laws in the middle of gun child ki ki killings shows real contempt uh, for the people themselves and for the loss of so many of their children. Uh, the police chief was, was perhaps clearer than any. He says this bill puts the lives of his officers uh, in danger and will disproportionately affect children because it looks like we've gotten a hold of many of the adult homicides and we have just the opposite situation with the children. Uh, the mayor uh, was unable to meet with uh, Majority Leader DeLay. However, uh, Mr. DeLay has told me that he would be speaking with uh, Mayor Williams this evening, I'm hoping that, the, that as a result of that talk, uh, perhaps this bill can be withdrawn. Uh, Mr. Delay has actually been a good friend of the district. We have a whole new family court division that he was very useful in helping us to get. Um, the mayor believes he has made uh, a tremendous progress in improvements in many ways in our city. And Congress comes forward to tell him so on both sides of the aisle, he thinks that this bill directly undercuts his work in reducing homicides. Uh, and he asked me first to ask that the bill with, be withdrawn. Uh, then he reminds me, and I remind you, that the city is under an orange alert. This, of course, has exasperated our city because of the primitive approaches that are being used, kind of 19th century approaches, like checkpoints and blockades, the kind of approaches I have to tell you that my grandfather who entered the DC Fire Department in 1902 would have done <laughs> for conditions at that time. So everybody's being inconvenienced uh, in, in horrific ways. Many, many in the city believe there are greater dangers to the way they're doing it. Under an orange alert, peering in your car every time you come up Independence Avenue and Constitution Avenue, stopping you there, closing off a street to the major transportation hub of the district, uh, Union Station on the one hand, and allowing assault weapons and 
uh, handguns into the district on the other. Nobody could say that that was a sane act or that it would help either homeland security in this town or the security of our residents, the 200,000 federal workers, the, mil the 20 million visitors who come. You'll look far and wide before you find anybody in this region who believes that the way to quell the remaining violence in the district uh, is to enhance the ability to own a gun in the city. I don't know if you know who would own them. That's why people shouldn't mess in other people's business. But I can tell you who would own them and exactly what would happen to them. The data, of course, is, all, is overwhelming that guns are used seldom uh, when you break into somebody's home. In case gentlemen and ladies don't know it, at least I don't know about your town, but they do wait until nobody's in our homes to break in. So our folks don't sit there, you know, waiting for somebody to come in so you can shoot them and be the hero of the home or of the neighborhood. Uh, these guns are gonna be used here if we have them here in the same way that, that the data shows us they're used across the United States overwhelmingly in domestic quarrels and, and, and quarrels among acquaintances. And that's the first place. The second place they're used is in suicides. And the third uh, most important use is kids who are simply curious shooting other kids. Uh, that's, that's what happens there happens here, it will happen much more here. So I first ask that you uh, reconsider this bill uh, and withdraw it. If this bill comes forward, but the police department and the superintendent ha has asked me to at least put forward one amendment, and that amendment would uh, uh, disallow uh, so-called cop killer bullets, the bullets that pierce armor. Since Children, above all, have been, children and cops are the ones that are most likely to receive the gunfires. And since this bill would make ammunition now available, we ought to look at what kind of ammunition, at the very least, we're talking about in my amendment simply goes to that issue. First, we, we ask that this bill would be withdrawn, not only on uh, ordinary American self-government standards that you all insist be applied to yourselves, but also because um, it means real danger uh, to all who live and work here and especially to our children. Uh, if uh, for some reason you go ahead with this bill, then we certainly ask that my amendment be made in order. Thank you very much, Ms. Holmes Norton. We appreciate your being here and thank you for your thoughtful testimony. Mr. Linder. I, I just have a comment that if, if the law works so well, if you're so worried about people having guns, why do you have so many murders now when you have a lot of cities you may not own a gun in this, in this town? It's, it's interesting you should ask that because the, the uh, police chief was asked that today and he, 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 he could only shake his head. In a real sense, the question uh, answers itself. If we have so many murders when almost 100% of the guns, the police tell us 97% of the guns come from outside of, of the district, for a moment, think about what would happen if you could buy a gun in the district, if you could keep a gun in, the, in your home in the district. Apparently they do. Can you, can, you, can you believe that those guns would do anything but increase homicides in the district? Is there any case to be made that by making more guns available in homes or any place else, you are committing an act of compassion on the district to reduce gun violence here. I'd like to hear that case made, make Mr. That case. Linder. I'll make that case. In the states that allow concealed carry and the communities that allow concealed carry, where anyone may carry a gun, there is much less crime. That is a fact. There is another piece of data that you not referred to, but one of the major news magazines in the last three years did a story that said of the 30 or 40,000 people that are killed by guns every year, there are two million crimes that are stopped because someone has a gun in the house when people try to rob them. Uh, I, I, you can make all kinds of good arguments to me based on we shouldn't meddle in your affairs, but I think your statistics are simply wrong. Thank you. Mr. Linder, I can understand uh, that there may be jurisdictions that can make the claim that by carrying a gun, there is a causal effect 
between the ability to carry a gun and whatever is the crime rate in that district. I wonder if you could show me that the reason for that uh, is that people have been able to use that gun to stop crime. Now, that's a, that, that, you'd have to show me that causation. That's the first thing. The second, uh, my second response would be this. I have nothing but respect for jurisdictions that have decided that the way to control crime in their district is to let citizens carry guns. That is what having fe a federalist America is all about. Uh, we are astonished that you would not believe that in this big city uh, that we are capable of deciding what, in fact, will quell violence here, or that what has an effect in one place, even assuming your, your causation, would necessarily have the same effect in another. We respectfully differ, and we believe that as American citizens, we have the right to differ and to control the criminal laws in our own city. And we're going to insist upon that right, continue to insist upon that right, whatever this House does. I'll give you one more causal relationship. The Western nation that's got the largest increase recently in the last several years in violent crime and the killing people with guns is the nation that demanded people turn in their guns, and that's Great Britain. And the honest, law-abiding people turned in guns, and then they became targets for those who wouldn't turn them in. I just, there are, there are data out there with which uh, you would disagree, and, and the facts are there. I understand, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, again, they are sovereign nation. We're federal, uh, a federal republic. We allow people to do what, what they think is best. I thought your side of the aisle stood for uh, self-government and local control. It, it looks like that doesn't apply to the District of Columbia. But I remind you, sir, there is an orange alert up. And, and whatever you think about guns, the last thing as a member of Congress you ought to want is anybody to have a gun in this town who doesn't need it. And the people who need guns in this town are the Capitol Police, the Metropolitan Police, the Park Police. My folks over in Ward 8 do not need a gun to come out here and get the guy. J drive by shootings go on all the time. Get the guy who stepped on somebody's foot or, 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 or who messed with him in school. I don't know about your jurisdiction. I wouldn't deign to tell you anything about your jurisdiction. I only ask for the respect that I deserve as the member who represents this jurisdiction. Um, <clears throat> I want to thank the general lady for her testimony, and, and I, I agree. I mean, um, she, she is the representative of the District of Columbia, and um, I think we need to look to her uh, as to how we deal with these matters, and I, and I think we should respect um, her views on this, and, and, and if it were up to me, this bill would not come to the floor. But I just I want to just point out one thing. As, the, as this bill is originally drafted, and, and this is where I have a problem with, uh, with my colleague, Mr. Linda, just said, I mean, I don't know how, for example, um, we would all feel safer uh, if, because this bill undoes many of the security measures that have already been put into place. Um, they, this, as the bill is written, if this bill became law, someone could legally possess a semi-automatic semi sniper rifle and armor-piercing ammunition in an apartment overlooking Connecticut Avenue, which is a common route for motorcades. I mean, ice cream and hot dog vendors in the mall could be armed with assault weapons. A Capitol Hill resident who lived across the street from the U.S. Supreme Court could uh, sit on his porch with a fully loaded semi-automatic Uzi. Um, I don't know how that makes anybody feel more secure. So um, I, uh, I, I want to thank the general lady for her comments, and I hope that we don't see this bill on the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I appreciate being uh, here in front of all of you. I have three amendments. Basically, the First Amendment would add assault weapons and large capacity ammunition magazines to the firearms remaining illegal under the bill in front of us, uh, 3193. I strongly disagree with the bill for many reasons, uh, some of them that have already been stated here. But more than that, I think that when we Think about 
illegal weapons recognized as great threats to the public and the law enforcement in this area. Just this morning, we, uh, most of us all got letters uh, telling us how we should be safer in our areas, whether it's home or here in the district. But when we're starting to talk about uh, assault weapons or the weapons uh, allowing DC to have weapons openly, these weapons are such great threats that even in this misguided radical bill, they are kept illegal. And I'm basically talking about the three classes of weapons that are machine guns, sawed off shotguns, and short barrel rifles that are in the uh, underlying main bill. These weapons have been illegal across the nations for several decades now. However, it is now the assault weapons and high capacity uh, ammunition clips that threaten our law enforcement officers. The American people support banning assault weapons by overwhelming majorities. As recently as December 2003, an NBC News Wall Street Journal found 78% of adults nationwide support banning assault weapons. Also, 57% of gun owners and NRA members happen to think that we should keep the ban in place. Banning assault weapons is supported by virtually every federal, state, and local law enforcement agency across this nation. This includes the Fraternal Order of Police, the National Sheriff's Association, the International Association of Chiefs of Police, the Majority City Chief Associations, and the International Brotherhood of Police Officers. ATF has found criminals prefer assault weapons over law-abiding citizens eight to one. Also, multiple capacity clips holding up to 50 rounds of ammunition are a tremendous threat to the public and to our law enforcement uh, officers throughout certainly this area and certainly throughout the country. Many state laws recognize this by limiting hunters to clips carrying six bullets or less. And yet, by allowing the assault weapons ban that we should have done last week to expire, we're gonna be going up to 50 to 100 clips again. And let me tell you, I know personally that reducing the amount of clips in a bullet, in a, in a clip, can save lives in the end. Making large capacity clips illegal in DC gives animals a better chance of surviving a shootout than our police officers. My second amendment, I will be requesting the committee to waive points of order on my amendment to HR 3193, basically to reinstate the assault weapons ban that we did not bring up on September 13th. I won't go through the details of it, but I will say that when we're trying to save lives, and I'll answer to the question of uh, the shootings and the killings here in the DC area and basically going back to certain states that have carry laws where they've seen crime come down. I don't know whether you're talking about the same areas of cities that basically are facing uh, the privacy that we have here, uh, living conditions that we have here. And the reason DC has so many guns is because we don't have any federal laws that basically allow the stoppage of guns coming into DC. If we had a federal law where people could still own guns, but respecting those states, and especially on the DC, even though it's not a state. But what I, I, what I don't understand with this bill is how you would even take our Capitol Hill police and put them at risk. I really don't understand that at all. We're talking about having terrorist cells in this country. We saw what a DC sniper could do two years ago by taking a gun that was banned on the assault weapons ban, but unfortunately, the gun manufacturers have been able to do copycats, and that's what the Bushmaster was. It cost the DC area, the Virginia area, and other surrounding areas millions of dollars in business. That seems to be the only thing around here that people really care about. No one wants to talk about how much it's costing our healthcare system every single year. CDC is not allowed to release those figures anymore because the NRA many years ago said that it was unfair to gun owners. The American Medical Association and doctors have come up with the information because I asked for that information years ago. Last year we got that information. For those that survive, our health care system 
is way over a billion dollars a year. That's not even counting the emotional pain that the families go through. I have never been against anyone owning a gun. Years ago, I used to shoot. I didn't like it. It's not my sport. So I dropped it. I understand uh, people in, uh, Perth, uh, well, New York State, our, our people love to go hunting. I have nothing wrong with that. But even in New York State, we were able to pass an assault weapons ban. And we have seen the drop of crimes with these guns being used. And now to have our cities being flooded by them, to put our citizens at risk, <clears throat> to put all of us at risk, by the way. We work here. A lot of our families live here. And yet, you're gonna allow a bill that will go through. My third amendment, if the other two are not accepted, and I hope they are, at least add to the bill with the three other three areas of having a sawed-off shotgun, a machine gun, a short barrel rifle, and I certainly agree with my colleagues on having these uh, uh, body-piercing bullets being banned, at least ban large capacity clips. Why in God's name would you give anyone the opportunity to outgun our police officers. When we go down to vote, we see our men and women protecting us. They certainly should be allowed any kind of gun they need, and they certainly should be allowed to have large capacity clips. Why we should have an, an average citizen being able to, or possibly terrorist, being able to have large capacity clips and put our young our men and women that are trying to protect us and our citizens at risk, I have no idea. And as far as England goes, yes, gun violence has gone up in England. Here in the United States, we have over 30,000 people killed a year. In England, they don't even get up to 30. So it does work. I'm not saying ban guns. It has never been my intent. It will never be my intent. But having a society full of guns costs not only our health care system, our police officers, and now more than ever, because we possibly have terrorists in this country, a great deal of danger. And I think we could do something about it. Thank you very much, Ms. McCarthy. Mr. Linder. For the record, I don't own a gun and don't have any interest in owning a gun. But the CDC did not stop <clears throat> making those reports because the NRA jumped on them. They stopped making those reports because several people, including me, said that's not your charge. Gun violence is not a communicable disease. And they finally came to their senses. Thank you. Sure. May I answer that? Sure. I didn't know it was a question. Actually, what the Center of Disease Control does, not even besides communicable diseases, though, but they have come up with solutions. Um, when our young uh, children started doing more and more skateboards or riding bicycles, and because there were so many head injuries, they came out with the recommendation of wearing uh, headgear. And that is what the Center of Disease Control does do. They actually look at what is costing life, whether it's a health care uh, crisis, which gun violence is, they try to come up with solutions. That's why we happen to believe that gun, gun violence locks. is a health care crisis? Gun violence is a health care crisis. When it's over a billion dollars a year, that is a health care crisis. You talk to any uh, rehab hospital in any major city, you certainly go into any of the hospitals in the city. Where do you think our doctors are being trained to treat those from Iraq? They go into our inner cities and learn what gun violence can do. Did you, was it your intention to imply, at least I inferred that the terrorist cells are going to be stopped from getting access to guns if we pass the assault weapon ban again? We're making it easier for them. You don't think it's easy now? It has become harder. It is and it has become harder. Why are we giving it away to them? I want to thank the general lady for her compelling testimony. And, um, and I share her views. Uh, and I'll just tell her that I, that I agree with all her amendments. I, I will, I'll make sure they're offered in the Rules Committee. And I hope a majority of my colleagues will vote with me to make them in order if we bring this bill to the floor. 
Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you very much for being here. Ms. McCarthy, we uh, certainly appreciate it. And that will conclude the uh, Thank you. hearing portion for consideration of the District of Columbia Personal Protection Act. And uh, let me just announce to uh, our colleagues that it's our intent to reconvene at the beginning of the last vote on the floor, at which time we'll report these rules out, along with uh, it's our intention now to report out a uh, measure that will allow for a continuing resolution to be considered on the House floor that will extend to uh, November 20th. So without objection, the committee stands in recess subject to the call of the chair. of House committees meet tomorrow to look at the Intelligence Reorganization Bill, and we'll have live coverage of a couple of those meetings, called markups. In the morning, the Judiciary Committee will consider parts of the bill that deal with immigration and civil liberties issues. You can see that on C-SPAN 3 at 10 a.m. Eastern.